Ever since I can remember, I have always wanted to have a book written about my life. With YouTube, every video that a YouTuber makes, that video is also transcribed. The reason for these videos are I am going to be turning these videos into a book and I'm going to be using the transcriptions that YouTube makes and it would make it so much easier for me. These videos are not intended for everyone. At the end of today's story, I have a little footnote and some things I would like to share with you. Here we are in chapter two. I was into the home of Bill and Darlene. I was just a child that was being taken care of there. They didn't adopt me yet, and I don't even think they were considering adopting a baby, but they knew I had nowhere to go. So they kept me. I cried a lot, and it got to the point where I had to go to the doctor because my mom did not understand what was wrong with me. It wasn't until years later that I understood the extent of why I cried. My mother thought at the time that it was because simply I was sensing all of these things. We got into the history and we realized as a very small baby, I was susceptible to some things. But here I am at their home. And so they lovingly raised me. And I oftentimes had a lot of stomach issues and I wasn't an easy child to take care of because I just really cried a lot. And there was nothing really doctors could do at that time. They didn't quite have the knowledge that they do now. And so my life was revolved about learning about the Lord. My mom and my daddy were extremely strict and they grew up in the Black Bumper Church. My mom and daddy were very plain Mennonite, but they left the Mennonite Church a few years before I actually came into their home but yet they taught me the Mennonite values. And of course, you know, I share all about that in my videos. But the age of five years old, I sat at the kitchen table and my mom and my dad said they had something very important they wanted to share with me. And I was, I remember it like it was yesterday. Daddy sat on this side and it was me and mama sat on this side. And mother looked at me straight in the eyes and she got really close to me just like this. And she said, you know, Teresa, you weren't always our little girl. And at five years old, I contemplated that. She said, your birth mother died while giving birth to you, but you're our little girl now. We chose you and you are special. I remember that like it was yesterday and I totally understood it. I understood that my mother died and I wasn't their little girl and that's all I knew. And that's all they told me for many years. My mom and dad didn't go to any counseling. They didn't know anything about how to equip an adopted child. They just knew to be honest, straightforward, and give me the information that I needed to know. <laughs> and they did that all through my growing up years. And they just told me little bits and pieces. I remember one time that my grandpa came to our door and I remember him dressing very plain because he was Mennonite. My blood grandma and grandpa and my blood father and my mother were Mennonite. And I remember him saying, is that the little girl? And my parents said, yes. You see, they sheltered me. They did not expose me to my blood family. They sheltered me in many ways. When I was growing up and I was about, oh, I'm not sure. I think I was nine years old. I remember my grandma Brubaker, which was plain Mennonite, would tell different people. And that's the little girl. That's the one that they adopted. My mother would become furious inside because I wasn't talked about as being the adopted child. I was, was their youngest child, Teresa. They never said, oh, this is our adopted child. In fact, they never talked about my adoption only until the later years of my daddy, <laughs> only to about three years ago, up until three years ago when my dad passed away. They never mentioned about me being adopted growing up. 
But when my daddy became elderly, it was on his mind 24 seven. He would tell the nurses whenever we would go to the home, that is Teresa, we adopted her. Her mother passed away and we took her as our own over and over and over again. It was something so much in his mind and my siblings would say, does it bother you when he does that? Does it affect you when he does that? And I'd say, no, that's just my daddy. See, I was a daddy's little girl, always was and always will be. So growing up, I had a normal childhood and my parents were very sheltering and I grew up, I went to a Mennonite school and then I went to a Christian school. Around the age of eight, was the first thing that happened to me that was quite unusual. And I have a lot of stories of that. I remember late one summer day, my mother was in the garage and she was painting one of our benches. We had a nice pool and my parents were very well off and they were very particular and my mother especially was extremely frugal. We were known in the community as a family that we weren't hurting for things in life. We were well off. But my mother and father always had that Mennonite background where they didn't spend frivolously and they always were very giving to people in need. But it was summertime and it was a storm. And I remember standing at my kitchen door and my daddy was sitting at the table reading the paper. It was right after we ate and he always read the evening paper. And all of a sudden I was standing and I had my hand on the screen door and lightning hit the area near the screen door. I can't say for certain if lightning hit the door or if lightning hit close to it, but I was touching the door and immediately I did a backflip and fell on my back. It cracked really loud and my daddy looked up. I blacked out for just a moment and my daddy looked up from the paper and he said, Octa Leva Tessie, are you all right? And I shook my head a little and I said, I think so. He said, we need to tell this to mother. <laughs> and we went out into the garage where mother was painting and mother said, well, she looks all right. <laughs> and we went on with our life, but I didn't go on with my life. I was forever changed after that day. All of a sudden, I developed this unnatural fear of storms. Whenever a storm would rise, the panic and the anxiety disorder would affect me to the point where I had anxiety and panic disorder. I would become sick and I didn't know what to do. In those days, we didn't know much about anxiety disorders and panic attacks, and I did the very best I could. And my mother would sit on the rocking chair, and I was an older girl. I mean, I'm talking about from the age of eight to the age of 13. She would rock me whenever there was a storm. And some days it got so bad that I would hide in the closet and I remember many times that my mom would sit in the closet with me. I would sing and my mom would sing. My mother didn't have a voice, like a very beautiful voice, but oh, it was beautiful to me. She would make up songs and she would sing, bye, 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 bye. And she would sing, bye, bye. There was no words. My mother had a heart of gold. She was strict, but she had a heart of gold. And thus started my childhood life. I never seen my birth father in the years of growing up. I never seen my birth siblings up until it was middle school. I didn't know what my birth father looked like except for a picture. But yet we only lived about 12 miles away. I never thought much about my blood father, my blood family very much. I, I lived in a bubble, I really did. And wow, what a bubble it was. 
It was a beautiful world to live in. And then I reached to the age of, I think it was middle school age. And I met my blood brother for the very first time. Somehow we got talking about stories and he said about his father and all of a sudden I realized that this was my blood brother. And so I talked to him a few times and pretty much my whole life up until the age of 16 was just me living my life. They never talked about me being adopted. I was one of their own, even though I was extremely different. I didn't look like my siblings. I didn't act like my siblings. I didn't have any interests of my siblings. I was very different. I was, I was an apple in a bowl for oranges, but it was a life that I lived. And then at the age of 17 is where my life totally really began because at the age of 17, I got married to my husband, Kenny boy. <laughs> People say, why do you call him Kenny boy? Kenny boy. I remember I was young and my dad had to go to the courthouse to sign me away. And once again, I was signed away. But at age 17, I got married. And this is where we're gonna end for chapter two because a whole new chapter begins. Then this is where the learning really began in my life because I was still sheltered. I went from mom and daddy sheltering me to a Mennonite boy and his Mennonite family that continued to shelter me. And I continued to be sheltered and loved every minute of it until I started my YouTube channel. <laughs> really, it is. My speech was sheltered, everything about me. My maturity was sheltered. I, up until I made YouTube videos, I still had the mentality of a 15, 17 year old. And I think that's what makes me charming. Makes me look a little fake. I can understand that. Makes me look a little bit like I'm not, that I'm just pretending, <laughs> but it's not. Because I've always been childlike and I never learned what it was like to grow up in the world and have the world knowledge and I kept that innocence and I love it. I'm so glad I was sheltered my whole, my whole childhood. Thank you so much for watching the following video. Through my life, I've experienced trauma. Most people would say some of it was very extreme. You're not going to hear about my trauma. You're not going to hear about anything negative in these chapters of my life. About four years ago, I asked the Lord for healing in my life and he gave it to me. There's no reason to bring up the past and the trauma that I have gone through because God has healed my heart and my soul of all of it. I would like to share my life and what God has done in the everyday life that I have lived, not in focusing on the negative and the trauma because I'm healed. And when you're totally healed, you never forget. I remember it like it was yesterday, the situations that I have been in, but I no longer dwell on those and I don't need to bring it up ever again in my life. I truly believe that everyone makes mistakes. And while some of the mistakes, people ask for forgiveness from me and I forgave them, others will never ask for forgiveness. And I understand that. But for me to hold on to the bitterness, I'm only punishing myself. And now I'm going to add a reference footnote. When we discuss the word Mennonite, some people can be tripped up by that word. So my parents, when they left the Mennonite church and they still held on to Mennonite values, what does that mean? Well, that means that they no longer dressed like Mennonites, but still they taught me the Mennonite woman's way. My mom taught me to be a stay-at-home mother. In the Plain community, the women mostly stay at home, raise a family, and the men are the ones that earn a paycheck. Of course, that's not every community. 
There are hundreds of different types of Amish and Mennonites. Each community is a little bit different in their values and their tra traditions. My husband's mother wore dresses her whole life. She wore covering most of his life. She did remove the covering when she was an older woman. But my grandma Fanny, that I talk about in so many of my videos, she always wore her covering till the day she died. So while my mother did not wear a covering and did not always wear dresses, she still instilled in me the values. Many Mennonites are pacifists. They don't believe in any type of fighting or protection like that. When we got married, we were members of a Mennonite church that was quite plain. The majority of the women did wear coverings when we first got married. Through the years, a lot of them removed their coverings. In the next chapter, you're going to hear about my early years of being married and the strictness of it all.